Hey everyone, this is Tom Salemi. Welcome back to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. We're focusing this episode on two upstarts in the surgical robotics space. First, we'll talk with Kurt Azabarzin. He is the CEO of EndoQuest. This company was formerly known as Colubrix MX. EndoQuest has a, a very unique approach to bring surgical technologies into the robotic surgical suite. And then later on, I'll connect with Tavir Cohen. Uh, he leads Momenta Surgical. That company was formerly known as Memic. And uh, we'll explain why the name changed in the conversation and also learn about uh, what really makes Momentus a, uh, a totally different player in the surgical box space. So before we begin those interviews, of course, we'll have Chris Newmarker, Executive Editor of Life Sciences, bring us his new markers, newsmakers. But I wanted to tell you about some upcoming events. On this Tuesday, we'll have a Device Talks Tuesday brought to you by Celestica. That's going to focus on uh, supply chain challenges and how you can avoid having supply chain shortages impact your innovative cycle. Definitely worth checking out. Go to devicetalks.com to register for that. That's happening 4 p.m. this Tuesday. The next Tuesday, we'll have a Device Talks Tuesday. It's kind of a live Device Talks weekly podcast interview. I'll be talking with Adam Sachs, the CEO of Vicarious Surgical. We'll talk about Vicarious's growth and how it's approaching the surgical robotics. What's cool about this is it's going to be an interactive webinar. Folks who are registered can ask questions via a text chat box. So you'll actually be able to help me do my job. You'll be able to ask questions during this interview, and we'll play the whole interview on uh, an upcoming Device Talks weekly podcast. Please go to devicetalks.com, register for both Device Talks Tuesdays. You'll be able to watch them live or on demand if you prefer, but uh, both will be wildly informative. Uh, Celestica's is coming up next week, and my interview with Adam Sachs is going to be sponsored by or is sponsored by Sertronics. So thanks to both of those companies for uh, supporting Device Talks Tuesdays. Finally, we have a nearly full agenda up for Device Talks West. Go to devicetalks.com for more information on that. Now, let's not delay anymore. Let us get this podcast episode started. All right, you ready for this? Ready. Chris Newmarker, how are you, sir? Doing well, Tom. You know, staying busy. Actually, next week, I think we're going to get in one more little quick trip in before the end of the summer. And then, uh, you know, we're thinking we also got to like uh, in about a week uh, do the traditional end of summer ritual in Minnesota. Do you, do you know what that is, Tom? Is it involved going to the lake? Nope. No. No. Oh, wow. Involved That's a good some... guess, though. I mean, we, we do have 10,000 <laughs> lakes. I, it's, I think yes, on the license I've, plate. I've, yeah. I, I think you're right. Yeah. Does it involve some sort of Swedish dish or something like that? No. No, though I think they serve some of that stuff there. All right. I've, I've seen I'm, it around. I'm out of I'm out of ideas. I've what had is? like a Swedish style sausage sandwich there, but no, it's the Minnesota State Fair. The great Minnesota get together. The old got, MSF, eh? That's right. But a, a was a, my, my gotta exclamation. Go. You gotta go there and uh hit up your favorite food stands. Do you know what the most popular food is at the Minnesota State Fair? Uh polar bear. Mm, that's no. No. I think that's illegal, Tom. <laughs> Let's <Unless>, hey, <laughs> don't knock it till you try it, my friend. <laughs> Like mm, there is I've like never a gator, tried there's a gator meat stand. There is like a gator. <laughs> I've had gator. gator. Gator's good. Gator's yeah. good. It's kind of like yeah. yeah. So what is what is the the most popular food? Cookies. Go to <laughs> go get some so a bucket of sweet Martha's chocolate chip cookies and a glass of milk. And, uh, I was expecting some exotic food. No, like you can get cookies most chocolate. places. I in fact, I think chocolate chip cookies were invented in Massachusetts, I think. So. Oh, everything was, yeah. yeah. yeah no, we've, yeah. we've, we've invented build, everything build worthwhile. Build house cookie. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So, you go to the state fair for cookies. You can go to the supermarket yeah. for There's cookies, you know. True. I mean, yeah, so yeah. It's like, I, but, I think it's like the family you go there, you do all the fair stuff. And then on the way out, I mean, you see a lot of people leaving the fair with their families with buckets of Bucket, bu the bucket of cookies. You get the yeah, well, it put the bucket, bucket O in front of cookies, and I'm intrigued. Yeah, it's I, like, oh, I'll I take there. a bucket of, yeah. you know, they, they bake them on site. You know, like, okay, I got a bucket of fresh, 
fresh chocolate chip cookies. If I brought a bucket of O cookies into my car with my kids, we would just have the bucket. By the time we got home, I think the cookies would be gone. You get a glass of milk at the dairy barn. I think it's a quarter glass. So all you can drink. So get some, get some milk. <laughs> got cookies, got milk, you know. You wanna... You're living in the same century that I'm living, right? Because your 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 lifestyle sounds a lot more wholesome than mine. <laughs> There's also beer at the fair. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Uh, not with the cookies, though. That's not a good pairing. We've we've tried that. That's I know. No good. I don't know if they still have it. Summit in the past, like we had Summit's uh, Summit Beer, which is a big big craft oh, yeah? brewer here in Minnesota and St. Paul. They uh they have a uh, they've had like a mini donut beer in the past. Like it's, which I, I think they pulled that off by doing like a beer that was like has a very strong bready taste to it, and then they just put some cinnamon sugar around the edge of it like it's a margarita glass or something, and it does oh. it does give you a little bit of a mini donut effect, you know? Like so, I don't know. I'm open was- to it. <laughs> I was gonna go pumpkin sausage kind of route, but I'm open to it. I've, I've been it's you know like, I've been spending a- my beer palate a bit more, uh, so sugar with it but okay all right it's a it's, fair yeah, yeah now, that's you can try special it out. that's not a cookie that's special that's, that's right something. they yeah. they really work to give you a mini donut effect combined with beer i mean that's all pretty right. all there right well go. that sounds that so you are going to that oh you gotta go next to week yeah, yeah i think we'll be going next week so yeah okay gotta and you're you're off next week so yes. you will not be on the podcast okay heading heading up north a bit you know actually north. i will be back a bit at the end of next week so we will we will, we will catch up before we uh, pack off and go to the fair. Okay. All right. All right. Fantastic. All right. Well, well, that sounds like a fun-filled let week. Let the kids so. do the giant slides. And- <laughs> we should, probably should talk about metal devices. Oh, yeah. Think? We shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> the fair is so exciting, though, Tom. No, yeah. Let's talk about medical devices. That sounds like a plan. All right, man. All right. Before we get into your uh, award-winning new Marcus Newsmakers, and I'm going to create an award to give you so we could actually call it award-winning. Um, someone should give you an award, damn it. You're doing so much work for these new Marcus Newsmakers. Uh, we should Thanks, remind Tom. folks that Device I'm Talks... I'm going to give myself a pat on the back right now. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Device Talks West is happening uh, October 19th and 20th. That's the right. agenda is up. Uh, we've got great speakers. Medtronic, Boston Scientific, Abbott, and so on. Intuitive Penumbra, CEO, Johnson & Johnson, Gary- and- CEO. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, my god. It's gonna be a great show. So uh folks can go to devicetalks.com to register. All right, Chris. All right, man. What is number five on the new markers newsmakers? Number five is FDA approves Abbott. What was that? <laughs> that was me trying to do a drum roll on the table. Right? Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Yeah, anyway. Number anyway. five was <laughs> FDA approves Abbott's next gen spinal cord stimulation therapy. Uh, they, they announced FDA approval of their new Proclaim Plus spinal cord stimulation system, um, you know, with uh, their Flex Burst 360 therapy. Um, this is the next generation of their uh, proprietary uh, Burst DR stimulation tech. Uh, but, you know, they're, uh, they say this is designed to provide pain coverage across up to six areas of uh, the trunk or, or limbs. Um, and, it's, you know, has programming that, you know, adjusts. You know, a, a person's therapy as, as you know needs uh, needs evolve. So, uh, you know, re- recharge free, battery lasts up to ten years. So, wow. uh, yeah, just just that other, uh, you know, like advanced and uh, you know, in the you know pain pain relief uh, neurostimulation therapy, which uh, you know definitely needed. Um, last time I checked, we uh, still have a opioid abuse epidemic in this country so nice to give people other options you know to handle uh handle pain fantastic and we will be talking pain at uh, device talks west we'll have a conversation involving uh math mcdonald of boston scientific and jeff rogers from ibm research and how they're using ai to help patients live with chronic pain so that will be a fascinating conversation it's all right be Chris. Awesome. What is number four? Number four, you know, this was a surprise, um, but you know, it actually shouldn't be. Um, you know, Telfec Flex uh, to acquire standard bari- bariatrics and with their uh, powered stapling technology for a bariatric uh, surgery. Um, you know, staplers are a hot space. They're mm-hmm. they're a hot space in medtech right now. Um, you know, I uh, we just had a I had a recent you know interview on this podcast with a you know top official at Ethicon. They had their next gen surgical stapler uh coming out i mean you know this is uh this is important technology because 
things aren't stapled correctly, you're going to have complications and complications are going to like, you know, you know, cause more, you know, pain and hardship for people and, you know, cost the health system more money. So, so it's, this is actually important stuff. So I'm and, this, like- and this stapler, the standard bar- bariatrics Titan SGS was recently named as one of the most innovative metal devices of 2022 by the Galleon Foundation. Yeah. Pre, Pre-Galleon? Pre-Galleon. Pre-Galleon USA, USA Awards. Awards. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, one of the nominees for, for that. So, uh, so yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is some cutting edge uh, technology here that they're, uh, that they're acquiring, um, you know, in fact, uh, you know, like, uh, like their, uh, their CEO, Telvox's CEO said that, you know, this, you know, he said this uh, acquisition adds an exciting and differentiated product serving the large and growing sleeve uh, grastectomy market. You know, they're estimating it's going to be, a, you know, pro- approximately 120,000 procedures annually in the U.S., uh, you know, in this space. So, so yeah, very, very cool. So we'll be, need to find out what uh, what they're able to do with this technology, with this acquisition. Well, Kurt Azabarzin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate your time. It's great to focus on uh, EndoQuest. And I have to say, not that this is an award you necessarily want, but I think of all the renames I've heard, this might be one of the better ones going from your previous name to this. I, I didn't quite know what uh, Colubris RX MX, Colubris MX said, but EndoQuest, I can kind of see where we're going. So so good job with the branding. Thank you. Yeah, it's, <laughs> kind, of, it's kind of somewhere where we actually see the connection. You know, our, our, our vision is to do less invasive surgery in the, in the luminal space and it kind of drives. And so it, it was a team effort, you know, but I think we're happy with the name. No, it certainly works. So tell us a bit about, uh, well, a little bit about yourself. How did you get to work in the med tech industry? Yeah, you know, I, I have to say I'm I feel very blessed because right out of college, I, I started working in the field of medical devices, and, and this is 1983. So mm, wow. we're talking f- almost 40 years and have been in it, uh, been this space since the beginning. You know, I've been blessed to be part of many evolutions or in surgery from, you know, going from open surgery to laparoscopy and then from laparoscopy to robotics. And I think now the future is, you know, scarless surgery or an aluminal surgery. So I, I, I really am blessed. You know, people ask me, how did you get so lucky? I'm like, and the word is, that is the word I got lucky, you know, hard work and dedication to the, to the trade, because, you know, it's very rare to have that opportunity to, to really work towards seeing the results, you know, in, in patients and, you know, benefiting in the relationships I've had in many years with surgeons that are, I can call friends and mm-hmm. partners. So I've been really blessed. So you, you've worked through some of the uh, the revolutions in surgery, and it's an interesting point. We talk about robotic surgery being this uh, this revolution, but you get a look at laparoscopic surgery as being a, a, even a bigger evolution or generational leap than this. Uh, how do you view it? Yeah, no. So again, I am, you're going to get a kick out of this. I was in the OR those days, we're talking almost 30 years ago in the OR, working with the surgeons who were thinking about, well, how do I do this procedure with a couple of little small holes with long instruments? And, you know, how do I create this space? And I mean, so we were in really partnering with them to, to develop the procedure to begin with. And, and then after that, you know, what instrumentation you need. And it was just, and it kind of evolved, which, you know, again, it's amazing to watch that happen, right? And you go after easy procedures that can be done, you know, from open to, to, to laparoscopic. And then eventually you got into more advanced procedures, as you can, as you know, now they're doing some significant advanced procedures day in and day out with really good results. So it was really eye-opening to see that. And, and, and I, and I would tell you the word enabling comes to mind, right? Minimal invasive or laparoscopic surgery enabled surgeons to do things less invasive, right? That was really, really important. Better outcome. You know, at the beginning, it was a little longer, but now the shorter time, you know, faster recovery. So, so to me, it was, it was just a win-win situation, but it took a while. I mean, it, it took a good 10 years for it to become, you know, kind of a standardized and, and, and you know, for, for the masses to start, you know, embracing it and, and, and using it on a day-to-day basis. So... Talked a bit about uh, about EndoQuest and its technology. What what are the origins? Yeah, so you know, it's a dream of mine personally. The reason why I'm here running this company, you know, I I've been blessed to have some really key roles in my career in the robotic field, and I've had some really successes. And 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 this was this was a dream of mine. And 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 I have to tell you, if you talk to twenty advanced 
minimal invasive surgeons, they'll, they'll tell you the same thing. It's a dream. It's been a dream of ours to do scarless surgery, right? And number one, and number two, to go where the disease is, go locally where the disease is, right? If you have a disease in your esophagus, to go through your thoracic cavity to get to your esophagus, it's just, you know, and, and it just not, doesn't make sense. The access is, access point is not there versus just go through, down your, uh, down your mouth, down the esophagus, and then treat the disease right there locally. But more importantly, without any scars or, you know, even a less invasive approach. Now, today, there are companies that are doing some of these things, not robotically, but they're not doing surgery, they're doing intervention. To me, surgery is ability to uh, apply traction and counter traction, ability to lift and cut, ability to suture and not tie, to truly do surgery. You know what I mean? That's what you're trained to to do. And, And that's what our company does. We have a flexible, we think we are the world's first, we will be the world's first in the luminal or flexible robotic platform that is focused on upper GI and lower GI. So endoluminal through the mouth and then uh, transanal through the anal canal and then okay. get all the way up and treat diseases within that, in, in that region, upper GI and lower GI. What are the origins of the technology? Who developed it first? Yeah, sure. So it came out of UT school uh, in, in Houston, medical school. And, you know, it was it was a, a neurosurgeon, general surgeon who partnered together to come up with the concept. And then, you know, UT uh, pretty much embraced it and allowed them to develop it some more under the UT umbrella. And then the company went on its own and fundraised about five years ago now. And, uh, you know, it's been based in Houston. Half of the group is in Houston and the other half is in uh, in Seoul, uh, South Korea. And what was it? Was it developed? Was this technology developed for this purpose? Did you derive it from something else? What, uh, yeah, what inspired so actually, its creation? So it was actually the vision was for the neurosurgeon to uh, to try to do uh, spinal spifida in, 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 in onboard fetuses. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea was to have a flexible robot that can actually perform a procedure inside a fetus as in the mom's wound, you know, inside the wound and then uh, address spinal spifida. But that was the concept. That's how it started. Um, but the, the challenges became significant and then just they just couldn't make it work. Oh, so then they partner with this general surgeon who is now our uh, chief medical officer and kind of took the different approach of, you know, let's focus on and the luminal surgery, which is upper of lower GI. Interesting. So yeah, that's an ambitious uh, objective to work on a fetus. And this is certainly a, a zooming out a bit, but still still very ambitious as well. What are the challenges that, that are posed by going through the uh, esophagus or, or through, the, <laughs> through the anus? Yeah, you know, we, we don't have enough time to go through that. <laughs> uh, it, it's probably the heaviest lift in my 40 years I've ever been involved in, I mean, I've, I've had, I've stood up many robotic platforms in my past, you know, as, as recent as, you know, two, three years ago, this is the, the heaviest lift because, you know, all the challenges that, that you can imagine with standing up a medical device robotic platform gets magnified and, and it gets even more complex when you have the, the flexibility factor, right? The ability to, you know, have different shapes and geometries and, and still be able to function and have the precision at the tip, which is really the critical component, right? Surgery is all about precision. You know, we mm-hmm. learn about surgery being precision. So the, the, the challenges has been that, right? You know, it's really focusing on the ability to be able to not only get to the, the lesion inside the lumen, but but give the performance time after time after time after time, right? Because, you know, this is a surgical device, you know, it needs to do what it's supposed to do, and it needs to do it repeatedly as many times that is indicated for. So that's been the biggest challenge, to be very upfront. But we feel very comfortable, very good about it. We feel that we've, you know, all the challenges are behind us. And now we're just pretty much standing it up for the, you know, to put it through the approval process with the FDA. So how have you done it? Can you talk, this is a podcast and uh, we're not able to really show images of the, of the system, but describe it for us, if you will, what's your technical solution to overcoming those challenges? Yeah, I mean, so you're dealing with cables and motors and pulleys and you're dealing with material science, you're dealing with the ability to keep all those tolerances in, in check. And that's really what it was. It was a combination of the what I just mentioned, team working really hard and understanding 
you know, what could go wrong and, and, you know, how do we address it? The good news is with the robot is that the robot actually can be part of the solution, right? Because the robot can actually give you indicators of, of, of what needs to be done next. So we learn from that a lot. And so everything we've in, included so far in our latest design continues to get validated, you know, by our robotic platform. We have 10 systems that we use for, for research and development. And these mm-hmm. These systems are constantly running these tasks 24-7, right? So when you came to our, if you came to our facility, you see these robots running these different, you know, uh, algorithms day and night to ensure that what we decided to go after, we we were able to address those issues and and and, and do it repeatedly and, and and do it safe and effectively. And the arms, the robotic arms, tell us what they resemble. Are they curved? Are they bendable? How does it function? Yeah, really cool. So, so they, so they, 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 they're flexible, obviously, because they have to be flexible. Right. But once you deploy them uh, inside the lumen, because you know they're part of. If you imagine, there's an overtube, a, a, a steerable, flexible overtube, which is which is kind of a flexible, call it a camera overtube under visualization. Once you get to the lesion. You know, this is all flexible, right? Then you arm or deploy these two robotic arms. And the best way to explain it is that we're also the only robotic platform that has seven degree of freedom. And one of the extra extra degree of freedom is the elbow uh, concept. Mm -hmm. So when the arms come out straight, the first thing they'll do, they'll go to elbow. So that gives you this kind of a, a, a what we call triangulation, which allows you to get to tight space in a tight space, get to the, get to the lesion or get to the target. So that's the first degree. And then, then the rest of the wrist kicks in and then the rotation kicks in. And um, so there's, uh, it's just amazing, just like a hand inside, inside the, the lumen, but the key being the having the elbow that allows you to now get to a very, very tight space and, and, and be able to hit your target. And, and what are some of the conditions that the robot would be used to treat? Yeah, so transanally, you know, non-cancerous lesions, which is, you know, polyps, you know, uh, all, all kinds of different lesions. And, and the beauty of our technology is because we do true surgery, we're able to remove these things in block, which means in one piece, right? Because you want it to be all in one piece and you want to remove it in one piece because you want to do histology and pathology to make sure that not only you got the lesion, if there's no, that you got, if to God forbid there is cancer, that you can actually uh, identify the, you know, the, the lesion and also the, the margins. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's on the, on the lower GI, on the upper GI, a disease of the esophagus, you know, Barrett's disease, any type of disease of the esophagus, you know, removing layers, as you see disease layers from the esophagus, then getting into the treating of GERD, which is, you know, reflux disease and ability to do inside out uh, GERD, which is really uh, unique. And then eventually going into the stomach and doing disease of the stomach, if there's anything that, you know, needs to be removed, polyps, you know, lesions again, but also ability to do what I call inside out uh, sleeve gastrectomy for uh, bariatric procedures or weight loss procedures as well. Because, you know, because if you can imagine, can you imagine doing this without a single incision, right? Doing it all through esophagus into the stomach and then creating a, a, a small sleeve that allows you to lose weight without a single incision. So that's really the, the holy grail. And that's really our focus. So focused at the beginning is lower GI, which is transanal. Once we get that approval, then then we would file for our upper GI, which includes esophagus, GERD, and then eventually uh, stomach and and, uh, weight loss surgery. So what does the robotic system allow a surgeon to do that they're not able to do with existing non-robotic solutions for notes? Yeah, good question. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't recommend watching any of these current procedures on YouTube mm-hmm. uh, because it's scary, right? And 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 when I say scary, is you're not doing surgery because you don't have the ability to lift and cut. You don't have the ability to apply traction and kind of traction. You're using flexible tubes to push and and push on lesions and snare lesions and just very it 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 it's, it's rudimentary it's, yeah. it's you know so so i don't call it surgery i call what's happening today intervention now some of these endoscopists do an amazing job 
I would say their hand counting that I would trust my family with. And that's not what you want. You want you want the masses to do these procedures safe and effective and, and do it with, with tools that, that makes you feel comfortable that you're actually doing performing surgery versus doing intervention. Understood. So, yeah. So as I said, there are everything I just mentioned today, there are tools that could effectively do these things. It's just not for the masses and, and, and the technology is really not ready for market. It, it's really a, a, what I would call early stage development that's ha- been happening. And again, very few people know how to use it and are effectively getting the result that that's required. So this is, a, this is a situation where you're hoping to raise the bar for these treatments, but also hoping to level the playing field as well and make more people able to do it. Right. Well, yes. Yeah, so I call it enabling. No. Our goal is to enable surgery because today you're not doing surgery. You're doing right. it. So I, I believe in surgery being the, the best result. Take it out. You mm-hmm. know, ensure, first of all, ensure you can see it. You know what I mean? Ensure you can mark it, then ensure that you can lift and cut it. You know what I mean? Ensure that if, if God forbid, there's a perforation or there's a bleeding, that you can actually throw a suture and not tie it. You know what I mean? If, if there's a if there's something that that you left as a as a whole, you want to be able to close it. Today, you know, they use devices that to me, uh, is not what I'm used to from a surgery standpoint. It's, it's, is it effective most of the time, mm-hmm. but not, not for the masses and not something that you could stand behind day in and day out. So that's really our goal is, is to enable those things to happen. But, but more importantly, sitting down, right, in, 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 a, in a very comfortable position ergonomically, having the ability to have your arms do what your arms want to do today, mm-hmm endoscopy, you know, you're up here, you know, next to your head and you're lifting, you're turning a knob one way, it goes the different way, you turn the other knob goes, you have to always remember that left is right, right is, you know, you know what I mean? Up is down, down is where now you're sitting down and you're actually visualizing your right hand is your right hand, your left hand is your left hand. You can pick something up on your left hand, you can apply, you know, uh, tension and, and be able to cut. I mean, it's just, it's surgery. It's what we are used to. So I think that's the wow factor for me is not only without a scar, but, you know, go over to diseases and actually perform procedures and surgery safe and effective. And God forbid you do have, because we all know that things could go wrong. You may have a perforation, right? God forbid, if you have a perforation today with current, uh, with the current modalities, you have to go to laparoscopic surgery or you have to open the patient. Mm-hmm. They don't have, they don't have the tools to treat it endoscopically. Well, for us, if God forbid you do have a perforation, you have the ability to suture and not tie. So, which is what which what a, what a laparoscopic surgeon would do, right? But you do it from, they do it from the outside in. You do it from the inside out, which is the right the right way to do it. Gotcha. So, I think that's the other huge advantage that we bring to the table. Yeah, I, you anticipated my next question, which is what's let's talk about what's uh, what's outside the patient, the, the robotic system itself. How is the surgeon controlling the tools? Is it a joystick sort of situation? Is it something else? And then I want to understand what the console itself looks like. How big is it? What is going to be the appropriate setting for a system of it, like of it because of its size? No, no, good question again. So imagine the, the surgeon console, um, which is the user interface component, very similar to Intuitive, very similar to all the other companies. You you sitting down very comfortably, ergonomically adjustable. Everything is adjustable, height adjustable, you know, in and out is adjustable. You you very very ergonomically correct sitting down. You're looking at a screen uh, right in front of you. You're not immersed like Intuitive is. Immer- you know, Intuitive you had has to be immersed into the the visualization component. Ours is just sitting up ergonomically correct. And the hand pieces are inline ergonomically correct hand pieces that mimic your hand, right? So you're sitting down, resting your, your elbows and, 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 and your forearm, and, and you're grabbing these user interfaces that are very ergonomically correct. I call them, we call them inline handles. They're pointing towards the direction of your instruments, right? You're grabbing them. You turn them left, they go left. You turn them right, they go right. You open and close, they open and close. Very, very intuitive, (laughs) uh, pun intended, you know, user-friendly, ergonomically friendly tools. And then, so that's the surgeon console, what we call the user interface piece. And then the robot itself, again, to compare it, it's, it's the same size as intuitive, Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty, because, you know, with robot, you need to have the substance weight and stability, right? It's not about, oh, how cool and small I am. It's about how stable and repeatable and safe I am, right? So it's got a pretty good uh, size to it, just like an intuitive is. 
and you know it's all done uh it, it could be uh, maneuvered all motor motor driven right so you can either drive it from the back you know with the motors or we actually are very uniquely positioned where we have a remote control of a piece that you can actually remote control the robot from at the patient site because once you get close to the patient you know you want to make sure you control all your movements very very precisely and you want to be seen exactly what you're doing so you bring it up to the patient from the back uh, and then once you get close to you know uh, docking it then you do it all remotely at the patient site so you can actually visualize it entering and then doing what you want it to do. So, which is very unique about what we do. It's, uh, I'm not aware of any other robotic platform that has that uh, capability. So you would find out, your system would find a home in, in the typical robotic surgical suite at a standard hospital? Correct. I mean, it's the same, it, it, it will require training just like how Intuitive does. I mean, they do an amazing job of, you know, having a dedicated team that's trained to use it. So we would have the same, um, but it's not any different than any other robotic platform. Speaking of a good branding opportunity, I think Intuitive gets mentioned in every interview I do about robotic surgery. <laughs> well, I have to say they are an awesome company. I mean, you know, yeah. look, you know, the, when was the last time you and I remember a, a monopoly in any space, let alone advanced space like this? Right. right? They've been a, they've been a soul for twenty some years, and the reason why is because they continue to excel and, and, and do an awesome job. They they are a machine. I, I call them the, you know, I, I'm not shy about it, right? They're really an innovative machine and, and they know how to execute. So what is it like operating a, a startup in the surgical robotic space? You've got, as you mentioned, a, a clear leader like Intuitive, but you've got others who are trying to step up with their own systems. And then you've got a lot of smaller companies like yourself trying to grab territory. How do you see this playing out? So I, you're going to laugh. It's like, it's like you're going 300 miles an hour with your hair on fire. That's what yeah, it's like. Running sure. it's not, it's, it's, it, but I, I wouldn't do it any other way. I love it. That's what I do. That's what, that's what I'm about. I'm a startup guy. I've been doing it for now 20 years. I love it. But I would tell you this. I give advice to CEOs or to investors when they come to me and they say, oh, we're coming up with another robot that's going to compete against Intuitive. And my advice is how? Yeah. <laughs> Walk me through. How, how are you going to compete with a giant that's been in the industry for 20 years? But the last 10 years dominating. Oh, by the way, how are you going to compete against Johnson & Johnson and Medtronic when they come in mm -hmm. as a small startup? Have a nice day. Go do something else because you're, you're dreaming. It's just that, that by itself, it's a huge, huge barrier to entry. And also to get a robot to market, it takes eight years and hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. And, and you know, not a lot of companies can have that kind of investment portfolio or investment background or backup to be able to address that and, and have the patience to go through 10 years of development with hundreds of millions of dollars. Those are things that I advise people. Like really think twice. Yes, robotic is hot right now, but it's pretty crowded as it is between those three giants, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're doing, we're not going where intuitive is, right? We're going into the GI suite, right? We're going to, and that's really why I, I chose to do this. For me, it's really, I address my own question. Like I'm not competing with intuitive. I'm not competing with, you know, Medtronic or Johnson and Johnson as, you know, we're going to be going into GI suites and our users are different as well. We will have surgeons, but we will also have uh, therapeutic, therapeutic endoscopic uh, GI docs that are going to be using our system. So, you know, that's how, that's how I feel we get around that, you know, competitive equation issue. Mm -hmm. That's real. It's really big real. Great. Final couple of questions. Where are you with the regulatory? You mentioned the FDA earlier on. Where are you with that process? You know, you don't know anything until it's, you know, it's done, right? But right. It, it is as, as FDA has been very clear about it being a, a de novo 510K, which requires an indication for use and an IDE. We're, we're planning to do a, a three-center, multi-center study in the U.S. We're, we're planning to go to the big hospitals that, that have the high volumes and have the capabilities and the goal is to, to be able to start our clinical studies sometime end of next year. You know, obviously, FDA has been very clear about doing significant communications with them well in advance of filing for your uh, regulatory uh, filings. So we're going to have multiple meetings with them in this year and beginning of next year in hopes of filing our um, IDE and, and our IRB for sometime first or second quarter next year with approval sometime in the next year. And final question of financials or business model. How do you see this system being sold? Do you have that mapped out yet? Is it a one large purchase? Is it a is it a robot as a system, as a as a service sort of model? What are you thinking? 
you just said it all the above. Mm -hmm. So there's no, those days are over. You know, intuitive was blessed to be able to write whatever equation they want to write. You know, you don't want to go, who's else, right? Yeah. But now, because of all the competitive situation, and also from a partnership standpoint, I really believe partnering is important, right? When you go to a hospital and you're trying to sell them a, you know, $2 million system or one and a half million dollar system, it's not an easy thing to digest. But more importantly, they may not have the budget, but they still may want to have it today. So we have our, our operating plan is very detailed. Five-year operating plan is probably the most detailed plan you've ever seen. But it does have the three components. You could buy it outright as a capital purchase. You could do a you could do a, a, a loaner program where we would, you know, you would do a per per use um, and then or you could do it per click. So we would give them options however it makes sense for them uh, to be able to get it in use and, 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 and benefit from, from its function. Fantastic. Well, again, great job with the rebrand and uh, thanks for Thank taking you. time to tell your story on the podcast. Oh, it was, uh, it was a pleasure and uh, truly uh, good to meet you. And hopefully we we'll talk some more in, in the future, Tom. I hope so as well. Thanks. All right, Chris Newmarker, what is number three on the Newmarker's Newsmakers? Well, number three on the list, uh, we have Medtronic earnings out this week. Um, and, uh, you know, this was this was an interesting situation because there was a, a pretty uh, critical analyst report out the week before that, you know, pretty much flat out was asking whether uh, Medtronic, uh, you know, management, um, you know, could, you know, execute through uh, – the present economic environment. I mean, as we've like, I think the big phrase we've heard through this whole earnings season is, you know, is uh, macroeconomic headwinds, you know, macroeconomic disruption, you know, that whole gamut of, you know, uh, you know, inflation, you know, strong U.S. dollar making it hard to sell overseas. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, labor shortages in hospitals that are, you know, reducing demand. You've got supply chain disruption. Um, you know, even in the case of Medtronic, you know, you've got. You know the, the these tender offers in China, where you know the Chinese government is you know really trying to centralize more how they pay for stuff, you know, so that they can you know, like reduce healthcare costs in uh, in China, and you know that's uh, that that's you know squeezing uh, you know sales for device companies too. So you know all that going on, and you know it was really like I I, I listened to you know uh, most of that earnings call, and they were really just trying to make the case that the here's what we're doing to you know respond to that. And, you know, we'll see if it, it plays out well. I mean, a lot of setbacks, uh, you know, oh, not, yeah, there's major setbacks. And, you know, over the past year, I mean, I mean, from, you know, the renal denervation study getting delayed, mm -hmm. supply chain challenges around the Hugo robot, you know, some big regulatory troubles for the diabetes business. But CEO Jeff Martha was kind of laying out all the things that, you know, they were doing to resolve all this stuff, like saying, like, they're behind supply chain challenges with Hugo. You know, we're going to be getting you know, results from the crucial renal, renal denervation trial in coming months. Um, he said they're uh, through 90% of uh, the things FDA was wanting them to do around the FDA warning letter for the diabetes business. So, you know, they're, they're making the case they're working through. So we'll, now, now we'll see if it like, if it you know, plays out well, um, you know, the an analysts are actually expressing, I could see a lot of skepticism about Medtronic saying they're going to ramp up, have a big ramp up in the second half of their, you know, fiscal year. And um, yeah, we'll see they're, there's, they're obviously setting some, some high goals. Let's see if they will, we'll see if they can execute and get it done. Yeah. No, very well reported piece by you. I'm looking at it right now again, and uh, a lot of, a lot of thought given into it, given to it. And uh, yeah, in addition to all the product challenges, they've also had to replace uh, a lot of senior leaders or at least find new, new, new senior leaders for pelvic health, for spine. Yeah. Uh, they moved Mike Marinaro over to lead surgical robotics Yeah. after uh, Megan Rosengarten uh, left the uh, left the position. So they've had a lot of uh, change up top as well. There are a few others. So yeah, it seems like maybe 2023 will be a year they, uh, they get some traction that they need. Yeah. It's kind of like, kind of reminds me of the sports team. Like, you know, you're reshuffling the, the coaching staff yep. and new diabetes leader. Yep. You know, being someone who lives around where Medtronic is run operationally, it'd be nice to, yeah, it'd be, you know, good for, good for this market around here in Minnesota to see, uh, you know, some things cutting Medtronic's way. So we'll, we'll see Absolutely. what happens. And we'll have uh, Medtronic well represented at Device Talks West. We'll have Brett Wall giving a presentation on bioelectronic medicine. We'll have a, a very uh, exciting piece of news from the neurovascular business 
Uh, we'll Very have cool. uh, gastrointestinal uh, uh, updates from uh, Gio DiNapoli, the, the business head of that group. And uh, their new chief medical officer, Austin Chang, will be on a, a panel there as well. So uh, cool. lots going on at Device Talks West for folks who track Medtronic. All right. What's number two on the new Marcus Newsmakers, Chris? Yeah, number two on the list, we have a really good, uh, really good roundup from associate editor Sean Hooley of uh, listing off, you know, seven brain computer interface companies that you know you just need to know about, you know, just because they've been making so much, uh, so much news. Um, and this is kind of it was interesting how this all came about because you know we've been reporting a lot about. Um, you know, Synchron, like our managing editor, Jim Hammeran wrote a profile about them a few months ago. I mean, interesting tech. I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, looking to deliver brain computer, p- computer interfaces, you know, into the brain through like a catheter based approach, um, mm-hmm. you know, like going, going in through a blood vein and, you know, putting, you know, something inside of a blood vein inside your head in order to have a, a BCI versus like, you know, the, uh, the pre, uh, all, the other methods have been more about like, actually implanting something in your brain um you know but uh you know we we got you know we got some guff on on social social media because you, know, you have something like uh you know blackrock nor attack you know which you know their their utah rays been around since 2004 i mean they're they're a major player in the space and they're kind of saying hey we've been We've been doing stuff in human patients for nearly 20 years. And, you know, you know, that's, that's fair enough. And we should, uh, you know, it was like, okay, let's do, you know, we also have, you know, uh, have you heard somebody called Elon Musk? Uh, he runs a he, car company, right? Some kind of car company. I, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he likes yeah, to yeah. light rockets too, you know, it's yeah. like, it's like, yeah. Almost own Twitter if I recall. Oh yes. yeah. That still might happen there. There's like, I think there's a good court case in Delaware about that. But anyway, <laughs> you know, another thing is he's got his neural link, uh, you know, company because he's in that that space as well. So I mean, got your you know Neuralink and Syn- Synchron getting a lot of press lately, but um, you know, doing a rec- uh, a good roundup and you know talking about uh, BlackRock Neurotech and you know all uh, all these other players, which you know could you know I'd, I'd say the jury is really out right now. Like who's going to really come out on top in this space? And it's you know there's just so much you know potential if the technology plays out. I mean, you know, they're starting out with. You know, like we could use this technology and enable people who are paralyzed to, you know, like, you know, you use devices and, you know, browse the internet with their, you know, minds, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, I mean, you could get, I mean, the futurists have a, have a really good time with this, uh, this technology, I mean, you know, we could, could, could we have a, uh, you know, like p- emergency responders who heighten their mental abilities with the, you know, this kind of technology do we have uh is this something that um you know someday uh someday we're just gonna like uh record this podcast with our minds tom you know we're just gonna <laughs> that will be worth listening to <laughs> that will require some editing let me tell you we'll spend the amount of noise in my head Something like that. Uh, just a lot of circus little, tunes yeah a lot of circus tunes <laughs> okay so no, that's obviously an exciting. A lot technology. of greatest hits from the '80s, like <laughs> yeah, that's right. My workout jam for sure. '90s is my driving jam. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. Stuck in the 20th century, it's like interesting potential. But yes, as someone who you know spent a large chunk of my life in the 20th century, it also just creeps the heck out of me. Like so, absolutely. I mean, know? obviously, with someone who has lost uh, the ability to absolutely, use their limbs, yeah. it's it could be life changing, and and it's very encouraging for that. And I'm sure there'll be other applications as well. Uh, that uh, I hope I'll never, never require. Yeah. So it'll be good, good time for the ethicists, like good, uh, good, good debates. Hopefully now yeah. before this thing advances to the point where it just like, uh, does what it just, does. just implant that we'll figure it out later. <laughs> what, right. what is number one on this? Number wanted? one on the list is uh, we've got our uh, you know, roundup of uh, surgical robotics companies. Uh, you need to know. And this just came back, came from us, like looking at, you know, how we've, you know, done this, you know, feature, this type of feature in past years. And um, it's gotten a lot of attention on our sites. And we were kind of like, hey, you know, the space has changed enough over the last year or so. We need to come back in here and, you know, do a do a good good round of like, you know, where what are all the big players right now? What are they doing? Um, you know, I, I think I'll be updating this like uh, probably the next week or so because I've been all of a sudden had all these other you know, companies coming out of the woodwork and saying, what about us? Like, what about our robotic technology? So we might have uh, some honorable mentions at the end of this too, so to provide even more information. But um, just 
just a really still just such a fi- fascinating dynamic uh, space right now. I mean, Intuitive remains the uh, dominant company, um, you know, like, you know, Medtronic and J&J, these, you know, two, the two largest medical device businesses in the world are trying to break in and compete against them. But then we got all these like uh, smaller companies that are, you know, just trying out all this, you know, different fascinating stuff to, you know, really uh, compete in the space. You know, I mean, Vicarious Surgical, you know, Corindas, which is part of Siemens Health and Ears. Mm-hmm. Actually, that's true. Corindas is part of Siemens Health and Ears. We got, so the, the three largest medical device companies in the world right now, Medtronic, J&J, and Siemens Health and Ears are all, all, all trying to, you know, compete against uh, Intuitive in the space and then we got like these smaller companies like vicarious surgical titan medical you know coming you know like trying to trying to do their own things we have moon surgical that you know you interviewed their uh, ceo in this podcast like uh like a few weeks ago you know they're that's right they got kind of like a different play it's kind of almost like a robotic surgical assistant you know so mm-hmm. let the that's right. let the surgeon do his or her stuff and the you know then then the robot's going to help back them up you know um so so yeah it's so good like go look at this article on mass device because you will get I, I, I we you know you know sean sean Hooley and i really worked hard to deliver on you know here's here's where things are in the robotic surgery space right now no, it's a very, very complete list. And as you said, we can always continue to add more. And uh, speaking of uh, Vicarious Surgical, we'll have Adam Sachs on the podcast in a couple of weeks. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to actually have him as a guest on our Device Talks Tuesday episode. Oh, so fantastic. actually, it'll be a live podcast interview. Folks can register and listen to it live. They can ask questions for of Adam and myself if they want to. And then we'll take the audio and uh, run it on the podcast. So kind of a, an interactive podcast interview. It's coming up on September 6th. And, it, you know, it's that's actually going to be, it's a really good time to do that interview too, because in their, uh, in their recent earnings call, they, uh, you know, like Sachs was saying, you know, they've, they finished the, uh, you know, the design for their, you know, next gen beta, beta two robotic surgery platform. And, you know, they're moving into the integration phase of the build, you know, they're moving into the next, next steps to actually like, like make this thing and mm-hmm. manufacture it, get it validated, get, you know, so, I mean, it's a really interesting time for them, you know, so this is, this is going to be great. Yeah, and we have uh, they've got a couple of new uh, new locations here in Massachusetts, so yeah. they're growing like like a weed, and uh, awesome. it'll be great. Yeah, it'll be a fun fun opportunity for me to talk to uh, someone directly in in front of an audience, and I uh, hope the audience will uh, will take part and ask some questions of their own. So there, you wouldn't they won't be able to hear the uh, the questions. I'll read the questions, but they'd be asked through a text chat box. So awesome. should be cool. Should be fun. So September sixth. Yeah will happen at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. Folks can uh, go to devicetalks.com. I hope by the time this podcast comes out, it'll be up on the website so people can register. It's free. And you can also watch on demand or just listen to the podcast. I'll try Is to the get beta it. 2 going to show up with them for the interview? That would be fantastic. Yeah. Maybe we could get, uh, yeah. How are you, yeah. beta? I am fine. Well, Vera Cohen, welcome to the podcast. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for a great invitation. So uh, happy to talk about Momentus, which is the new company's name, previously Memic, now Momentus. And I think it's uh, both names are great, but Momentus certainly carries a little more weight to it. So uh, interested in, in hearing the story. But uh, I'd love to hear your story first. Uh, you've got an interesting background finding your way to Momentus. What were you doing prior to, uh, did you co-found the company or did you join the company? Well, I co-founded the company and my background is, is actually I've been for many years in the Israeli Ministry of Defense to develop fine robotic systems, submicron accuracy, very fine articulate instrumentations. And in course of duty, I met with a professor from the Technion that had a revolutionary idea to develop robotic system that had fingers to make it easier to grasp different tissues. And he thought eventually having that will make the user interface easier to understand. And eventually, after talking to a lot of surgeons, I understand they want to feel immersed in the surgical field. So I've developed the entire platform that has the entire upper extremity of shoulder, elbow, and wrist, and similar to the human elbow that can bend and retroflex, by adding the shoulder to the plate, it allows more than 360 degrees of rotation and flexion, and that allows us to work in multi-quadrants through a single incision and to enable surgical procedures that are non-feasible to date. And of course, I'll talk about our first indication later on. 
Great. It's an interesting time with, with different companies coming in with different robotic solutions for surgery. But what role did robotics have at the Israeli defense group that you were with? Was it a, a surgical function or was it another function? Well, it was a, what I can say, it was the intelligence office, uh, the Ministry of Defense. And that, that's what I can tell about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that wasn't going to be the answer, but I guess we'll move on from there. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I have suspected that. So, so the origins, of, and you got into a bit, the origin of, of the, uh, what is now the Innovo system. You've rebranded the name of the system as well. Was it a surgical application that had been using in another function that you said, hey, this will work well in, in surgery also? Well, what I can say is eventually the origin of the technology was basically the pure idea of having a shoulder, elbow, and wrist miniaturized to fit into the abdominal cavity to allow the surgeon to reach regions that he just cannot reach today. Okay. And the entire idea in, in surgical robotics and in surgery overall, surgeon needs to place the end effectors to provide and, and, and perform surgical manipulations. And it can be performed with straight sticks instrumentation laparoscopy or with the current traditional legacy robotic system that has the same architecture working through fulcrum points in the abdominal wall, just mechanized with motors to ease the control and have better and more precise dexterity. Our idea is eventually by positioning the graspers using the proprietary shoulder, elbow, and wrist structure allows us to scale down the capital equipment significantly, mm -hmm. really significantly. It's so small that it can be even table mounted. Okay. And by that, it allows easier patient access. It can fit any size OR, and it actually allows the surgeon to do a very simple single incision docking through strategic insertion points and reach all quadrants in the abdomen. So one of the, the weaknesses of a podcast is not being able to see the system. So in, in could you take a moment and describe what the elements of the system that are in the body and that are performing the procedure, what do they look like? Are, are they windy arms? Are, they, are there many different joints to them? How do they look and function? So inside the anatomy, we have actually a shoulder joint, an elbow joint, and a wrist joint that allows the surgeon through those long and narrow tubes to work in all quadrants, even in retroflex towards the point of entry. And by providing all of those motions through those anatomical uh, restrictions that similar to the human elbow that can bend and retroflex, it can rotate a relative rotation between the shoulder and the elbow to really replicate the motion of the surgeons, the capital equipment has no moving parts at all. Therefore, the size of the capital equipment outside of the body is so small that they can actually hold it with my bare hands. Hmm. And therefore, the docking is much easier and faster. The draping process is faster and I can table mount it to allow changing the angle of the table, the surgical table during procedure. And from the console point of view, we also develop a proprietary controllers that allows the surgeon both to retroflex and to mimic the motion of the surgeon arms into the joints of the uh, surgical instruments. So it will actually allow surgeon that has no previous experience in transvaginal access, we'll talk about that indication later, to provide the same dexterity and ease of use they're familiar with laparoscopic approach, robotic approach, with the benefits of a transvaginal access. Hmm. So yeah, that's a great point. What does a surgeon interface look like with the system? What are they holding? Are they holding joysticks? Or are they holding gloves that kind of follow their movements in a field that tracks their, where their hands are going? What, how does it work? So the surgeon is holding controllers because it, it makes the uh, uh, learning curve very, very simple. And what we've learned in some of our usability studies and clinical studies that the user interface is very, very intuitive. Actually, we added residents into our usability study and to our clinical studies, and they've learned that to pick up the use of the technology within minutes. And the reason it's so easy and elegant, and maybe I'll touch base about the first indication, which is gynecology. Sure, go ahead. The, and, and why we decided to focus on gynecology, because it is a platform technology. We can do, we can do everything in technology in all quadrants. But I really wanted to focus on, uh, as a starting point, on specific set of indications that have tremendous clinical value and economical value proposition that can break the barrier and leveraging robotic technologies to enable different types of surgical procedures. So I saw a statement from the ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, stating that vaginal approach to hysterectomy is the procedure of choice 
whenever technically feasible. I said, what do you mean whenever technically feasible? If that's the approved choice, and that's a question I've asked one of our surgeons, why would you just use it in all of your cases? And he started to laugh and said, of course, it's a better way to do surgeries, but I can do it only in a fraction of the population in 10 to 16% of my cases due to restriction in the anatomy. If, if uterus is not prolapsed, it just the surgeon cannot reach that through transvaginal access. If the patient had previous uh, surgeries or adhesions, then there's no way that vaginal access is feasible. If uterus is not very small, again, vaginal is not an option. And I've told our surgeons, this technology will allow you, enable you to do surgeries that are really challenging today. Hmm. And when they saw the technology, and I'm talking about really the inception of the idea and, and, and our sick lab that we had, they jaw just dropped and they were just amazed by that. And I, I told them, we, we'll take it one step further. What we can do with our system, we, we can go transvaginally, then retroflex towards the point of entry. So the surgeon feels like she's inserted the instrument from the abdomen, but without the puncture wounds in the abdomen. So we actually take the best of laparoscopic approach, wow. which is the surgical technique and field of view. We take the best of robotics, which is precision and dexterity. And we're the only robotic system that can take the benefits of transvaginal approach that is associated with better patient outcomes in virtually no visible scars. So this is the reason we started to focus on gynecology, and now we're working on additional indication. So what, what percentage of these procedures can be done now transvaginally with your system? Most or a higher percentage? What's, what do you anticipate? Well, I, I can tell you that until now, in all of our clinical cases, we've monitored those anatomical restrictions, the prolapse level, uh, uterus size, adhesions, and we still didn't hit a wall. We saw that we can treat patient, and that's the data that was submitted for the FDA, with no prolapse at all. And we had cases with fibrotic and vascular adhesions and uterus size up to 15 weeks. And, and we, say, we actually saw that we can be much, much larger than that. So what we're doing now, and we're working with our first customers to collect more data, and what we can really see that we can broaden the feasibility of a transvaginal access significantly. Interesting. So let's talk a bit about, the, you mentioned the FDA. Where are you with regulatory approval for the system, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S.? Yeah, so worked very closely with the agency. It was a great process, a very collaborative uh, approach. FDA told us that we are de novo, and we worked with the agency in a very, very close interaction, and we got our de novo marketing authorization in 2021. And the reason eventually is with our system articulation, they've told us we cannot compare our technology and reach and dexterity to anything out there. This is the reason that we are at de novo and mm -hmm. there's no any other system that can facilitate a transvaginal access. So by working with the FDA, we got our de novo marketing authorization. And mm -hmm. from there, we started to commercializing our platform. We have, we have our Israeli headquarters and our U.S. headquarters in Fort Lauderdale, where we have our sales, marketing, customer services, professional education, product management and the manufacturing and uh, R&D are in Israel with, of course, several capabilities in two headquarters. So are you, you're fully commercial in the U.S.? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I can say we have great, great partners, great surgeons. And what we've learned, and that was one of the reasons that we had the rebranding now, is initially I thought it all about having the shoulder, elbow, and wrist joint that allows the surgeon to reach regions that are non-feasible today and allowing to, to do different type of surgeries. And what we've learned from our first customers is that it's an ecosystem. It's, it's much more than that. It's mimic was I am mimicking the surgeon. Mm -hmm. But we've learned that the shoulder, elbow, and wrist allow the surgeon to reach regions that are non-reachable today, allowing to miniaturize the capital equipment to have very easy patient access and easier setup and faster flow and allow surgical procedures that are non-feasible. So it really represents something which is much larger than just mimicking the shoulder, elbow, and wrist. And this is why it's momentous. It shows the momentum of the articulation and the technology, the great momentum that the company has and where we stand now with what's moving forward. And we really believe it's a momentous moment for the field of surgical robotics to have the capabilities to allow 
and advance the most minimal invasive approach, such as transvaginal and more to come with this very unique technology. So what is the call point for your sales teams? Who are they selling to? Who are you trying to get on your side to help advocate for uh, Momentus and for Nova? Yes, we are getting used to it as well, as you can probably imagine. But <laughs> eventually, we know we have a great team in place. We have what we did in last year. We really built a very strong leadership team on all fronts, from the early stages of R&D to uh, manufacturing, sales, marketing, and, and professional education. And what we know is everything we thought about our system, eventually by putting it by the hands of our first customers, we actually saw additional call points that we, we didn't think about it when we initially developed the system. <laughs> the ease of use and how uh, the setup is much easier when it's, when it's table mounted and how it's adapted to their own surgical flow. The fact that early on in our clinical studies, I've insisted that I've always took in every hospital we were to take the smallest room possible. Everyone thought I was confusing. They told me, wait, wait, we have a robotic suite. It, it's across the hall. It's the large room. And I said, no, no, give me the smallest room that you have. And in fact, I want to have 10% of our cases in your surgery center. That's the data that we've collected. And we really show that this technology allows us to go to a blue ocean with different type of hospitals, academic hospital, community hospitals, surgery centers. And it really shows that leveraging robotic technologies, and it was really a domino effect. Those shoulder, elbow, and wrist allows us to miniaturize this system to have smaller footprint. And that smaller footprint allows us to reduce the cost significantly. And that, again, the same domino effect allows us to allow surgical procedures that are non-feasible to date in different type of hospital settings. So are you selling directly to uh, OBGYN surgeons or to hospitals that have those, those practices in there? Who, who, are you, uh, who are your sales teams uh, working with? It's a process, of course, we're starting with surgeon champions and, and we're getting great feedback from many, many specialties within gynecology. Uh, and we're getting a lot of interest from other specialties as well that are working with us on developing our next line of indications. But through the surgeon, we're getting to the c suite of the hospitals or the surgery centers. And, and that's usually our process. And in fact, the system that, that we have is so different and so small in footprint but we actually have mobile showroom that we took. We bought several buses and we prepared them to have a mobile showroom. But we are now traveling throughout the States, giving hands-on experience. And I can give you an example of one of the most interesting comments that, that we got with that bus that surgeons are really excited. They're coming on to the, to the demo bus and they have a look on their face of asking, I, I thought you'll have your robotic system here. Can I get a hands-on experience? And I tell them, uh, of course, that's the very small robotic control unit you see at the end of the bus. That's the system. That's the entire size. Usually, the, our team just hold the system by their bare hands. So it just shows how our system is so unique. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about, about the size. I saw pictures online. Uh, I didn't see someone holding it, but is it the size of a toaster, the size of a microwave oven, the size of a 28-inch screen TV? Give us Give us some scale. Uh, I, I think a, a, a size of a, a shoebox, roughly. Mm -hmm. that, wow. that's, that's the size of our system, yes. So the, the setup for those, is it table mounted? Is it on its yes. own table? Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, Interesting. It's, 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 a, it's a surgical table. The key idea, and we saw that mainly within different specialties, moving the table, moving the surgical table throughout the case, that's a capability which is very important, especially in in, in different anatomies of these patients. And this is a very crucial capability is that exists, of course, in laparoscopy, and it's more challenging within a traditional surgical robotics to fit throughout the surgical flow. But the fact that the system is so small, going through a single incision, table mounted to the surgical table, allows us to have an integrated motion of the surgical table, and it just is useful significantly. Fascinating. You uh, mentioned earlier, just a few minutes ago, potential other uses. Uh, so how else might the system be applied? Is it for natural orifices only? Is it, uh, do you see it working in a general surgical suite? What are the opportunities? That's a great question. When, when we started the process, and I'm, I'm talking when I had the basic inception of the idea, I really was amazed by how broad this platform technology is. 
And we worked really hard to focus on our first set of indication that we got with the FDA, which is very broad. We, we're always talking about hysterectomy, but our approval is much, much broader. It it's includes salpingectomies and oophorectomies and cyst removals, et cetera, which is a real umbrella of, of different specialties, different procedures within gynecology. And our approach is to leverage the instrumentation and articulation to go through a single incision to a strategic incision points that has better uh, uh, clinical values, such as transvaginal for gynecology. There is a very interesting strategic incision points that we can facilitate, uh, we can facilitate for abdominal access that has the potential to have better clinical outcomes within general surgery, within hernia repairs, cholecystectomy, colectomies, and, and in the SRS was uh, the Society of Robotic Surgeries. They had a great, great conference. And we had multiple presentations showing our system capabilities, both in hernia repairs, in hemicolectomies, in transrectal procedures. And, and what we had there is actually our first customers were on stage to present their clinical data within our first approved indications in, in gynecology. We had patient testimonials as well that had great clinical outcomes. So we really see this technology as a platform technology that we are now ruling out to additional indications. Interesting. Final question. Uh, you had raised a significant round, I think, uh, last year. Is that going to carry you through commercialization? What are your capital needs going forward? And uh, I imagine you've been talking to investors. I, I'd be curious to hear how your, what your sense of the capital market is. Yeah, well, of course, we were talking to investors and, and, and different analysts and bankers throughout the past year. And, and eventually, the momentous capabilities, the momentous system and the Innova system has the potential to become the standard of care in gynecology and going much, much broader than that. We've raised significant capital to commercialize our platform. We had great first customers and real strong partners both from the surgeon point of view and the hospital management that working closely with us to, to excel and perfect the robotic program that we've launched. And we're moving forward to commercialize our platforms. And we, uh, as we keep going and growing, we are thinking of scaling up faster, going to more indication faster. And we are debating different investment strategies to really take this uh, technology into more indication within the United States and, of course, globally. Interesting. And I, I'm sorry, I said that was the last question, but your your answer got me thinking again. You mentioned earlier the blue ocean opportunity. I'm curious, are you talking to a lot of facilities that maybe haven't previously talked to a robotic surgery company just because it hasn't been in their uh, affordable or possible given the size that's required for some of the other systems? Are you finding a lot of, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of untapped opportunity there? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe it's something that started before COVID and, and accelerated significantly by that. The pandemic showed us that surgeries are being uh, pushed to the outpatient facilities, mm -hmm. to the surgery centers. Not all of them have the abilities to adopt surgical robotics until now from a footprint point of view and a cost perspective. And all of a sudden, there's a system that is very small, very easy to set up and to use at a lower cost settings that allows us to go to surgery centers, hospitals that not always had the resources to acquire surgical robotics. So I think that the past year was really exciting on what we've learned in the market since the mm -hmm. FDA approval just got us more excited about what's coming up ahead. Are you able to uh, share a ballpark of what the price tag is? And is it an outright purchase or is it more of a subscription model? How are you structuring that? Well, what I can share is, is we have different models that we can fit to our customers' need. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the field of surgical robotics that serves as part of a larger ecosystem, which is the healthcare industry is going to customer-specific requirements. And, and we have all the models that we need to launch robotic programs at the customers to facilitate and promote the most minimally invasive approach, such as transvaginal, to allow more patients to benefit from the most minimally invasive approach. And actual final question, do you use your, your own instruments or uh, can your system be used with other surgical instruments or surgical instruments manufactured by others? So we have a unique and proprietary instruments mm -hmm. that have the ability to work in retroflexion 360 and proprietary graspers that can deliver both monopolar, bipolar and grasping capabilities. And that serves for uh, the umbrella of gynecological indications. And we are 
developing additional set of graspers and instrumentations to serve additional indications as well. That was actually my final question. So thank you, Veer, for joining us on the podcast and for sharing a momentous story. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. All right, Chris Newmarker, <laughs> here we are at the end of the podcast episode oh where we do what what do we, what do, we do for like, folks like follow subscribe that's Come right on. we advise them to like follow and or subscribe this podcast uh just push it push play up uh, sorry push uh, subscribe or follow on your podcast application if you're feeling and fomo mo there's a reason you can just subscribe you'll get the uh, device talks weekly podcast striker talks podcast intuitive talks podcast and uh, you can also subscribe separately to the medtronic talks podcast and uh please do share this uh podcast on social media applications like linkedin and twitter where you can find chris at hey you find me on linkedin like chris newmarker just like a new marker and you can find me on twitter at new marker yeah, i'm on twitter at medtech tom i am on i am also on linkedin tom s-a-l-e-m-i so yes please connect with us on uh on those social media channels and uh once again don't forget to check out chris's uh and, and sean hooley's full report on the surgical robotic space it's available on the mass device site we'll also have a link on the podcast uh, page and uh, don't forget to go to Device Talks Tuesdays on uh, September 6th yes. at 4 p.m. for a live interview with Adam Sachs of Vicaria Surgical. And finally, of course, uh, Device Talks West. So the agenda is up. Go to devicetalks.com for, well, pretty much for everything. Yeah. It's all there. It's all yeah. there. You can find it conference information, Device Talks Tuesday information, podcast information. It's just, it's, it's just a center. And for all things med tech and writing, go to massdevice.com. So there you go. There you go. We got it. We, we, we got you covered. All right, Chris. Thanks, folks, for tuning in to this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. Tune in next week, and uh, we'll have a, another great episode of the podcast waiting for you. Hey, enjoy the rest of the summer. If you're in Minnesota, see you in the fair. Yeah.